Open up your Bibles to Psalms 27, 1 through 6. Psalms 27, 1 through 6. We've been coming out of Psalms, man. Minister Ann came out of Psalms Saturday in Atlanta. Uh, Pop Sam came out of Psalms uh, Sunday. And Lord, I was already in Psalms too. So we, the Lord want us to see what's going on in Psalms. He, he trying to draw our attention back to Psalms. Amen. So let's read it, y'all. The Bible says, The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the strength of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? When the wicked came against me to eat up my flesh and my enemies and my foes, they stumbled and fell. Though an army may encamp against me, my heart shall not fear. Though war may rise against me, and this will I be confident. confident. One thing I desire, one thing I have desired of the Lord is that will I seek that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life to behold the beauty of the Lord and to inquire in his temple. Verse 5, for in the time of trouble, he shall hide me. Look that word, Minister Sam. He shall hide me in his pavilion and in the secret place of his tabernacle, he shall hide. He said that twice. He shall set me high upon a rock. And now, hold on, wait. And now my head shall be lifted above my enemies all around me. Therefore, wait, therefore, I will offer sacrifices of joy in his tabernacle. I will sing. Yes, wait, I will sing. Yes, I will sing. He said it twice. I will sing. What you gonna sing, David? I'm gonna sing praises to the Lord. Come on, give God some praise for his word. This is one of my favorite psalms growing up, reading. And man, I didn't read this song so many times, and now the Lord has pulled on my heart. He says, I want you to teach it. <laughs> and I believe it's a, per it's a good psalm for in the time we're going through right now. I believe it's very encouraging if we can get a hold of this psalm and see what was going on in here. I think it's going to bless us tonight. Y'all ready for it? If I had to put a title on this message, it would be called, Fear Who? I'm Covered. Come on, look at your neighbor and say, you don't have to worry. Because God got you. Amen. Come on, give God some glory. Fear who? Fear. She, I'm covered. Amen. Amen. So, man, I'm just thinking, man. I'm always thinking about what I'm going to talk about, what I'm going to talk about, what I'm going to talk about. And so, man, for some reason in my last bit of studies, and as I open up the Bible, I'm always running across this one little Scripture, there's one little message that runs throughout the Bible. And a lot of times we can misread it. We can, we can read it or we might even just pass over it or we just don't, you know, it's just, I don't know. It can be passed over. But from Genesis to Revelation, you're going to see this message, this one little message that pulls up a lot of time. God repeatedly reiterated this message over and over when he uses the, the prophets, the children of Israel, he speaks this message over and over and over and over again. You know what that message was? Three words. He says, don't be afraid. Look, there's a lot of times we read the scriptures, we see about his mercy over and over. We see scriptures about his love continues over and over. We see scriptures about his faithfulness it's over and over. But one scripture that runs from Genesis to Revelation, God is repeatedly telling his people, don't be afraid. I researched it 365 times. How many days they have in a year? 365 times. The Bible talks about us don't, not being afraid. That's crazy. And I believe God put it like that to remind us to trust in him every day. Every day. Because God does things specifically. He don't make mistakes. And for many different circumstances, for many different situations, with many, uh, many of his children, when they would find themselves in hard times, God tells them over and over and over again. He tells them what? Y'all going to talk back with me? So look. 
Y'all can even go check this out. Go look, because I went and look it up. It's under the blue letter. If you go look up under the blue letter Bible.org, you're going to see a whole bunch of times where he told his people, do not be afraid. The first one that I noticed, it says, God, when God spoke to Abraham, God told Abraham to leave your country, leave your family, go into a land where I will show you. Now, Abraham didn't know where he was going, like, where, where, where I'm going? But in so many words, God told him, y'all help me out. Don't be afraid. All right. When God called Moses to go to Egypt to tell Pharaoh, what did he tell Pharaoh? Whenever he told Pharaoh, let my people go, he told him before he went, he says, what? All right. When the children of Israel was prepared, they was being prepared to enter into the promised land. Repeatedly, as you read the book of Deuteronomy, you're going to see over and over, God gives them a commandment through Moses. What did he tell them? When Joshua gets ready to stand on the border of the promised land, stepping into leadership, taking the mantle of Moses, he makes his first leadership move, about to make his first move. And this is what God tells him over and over. Elijah, when Elijah came to Ahaziah, when Jeremiah came to the children of Israel, when Ezekiel came to the Israelites, all of them, God told all of them to what? When Nehemiah stands on the wall and the word of God came to him, and he told what? What he told Nehemiah? When the angel came down to Bethlehem to tell Mary, to tell Joseph about Jesus, then he talked to John the Baptist, then he talked to Zechariah, then he talked to, uh, um, then he talked to all of them, and he told them what? When Paul was getting ready to speak to the church of Corinth, whenever the Holy Spirit convicted him and told him what? Matter of fact, when Paul was getting ready to train up and disciple, when he was discipling his son of the faith, Timothy, he told Timothy, hold on, when Timothy was getting ready to take his mantle, he told Timothy, wait, God ain't never gave you a spirit of what? But of love, power, and a sound mind. Come on, give God some praise. What God was trying to tell us all was to don't, don't be scared. It's like we always got the tendency. It's like God knew we would be scared. Like we got a tendency to be afraid of things, like scared. For him to put it that many times, we some scary people. And the crazy thing about fear, fear is something nobody, we all can't escape. It's a natural thing. But the reason why God tells us to not be afraid because he wants us to trust him. He wants us to trust him. And he know that one of the greatest tricks of the enemy is to it's to try to induce us with fear, try to get us to live a life of fear. So that's why he would always say, well, don't fear. I'm about to tell you something, but don't be scared. Don't be afraid. And so we'd always get our minds right. But to be honest with you, the truth of the matter and the fact of the matter is there is always something in life that gives us, might give us a good reason to be afraid. Huh? We go through so many things in life. We face so many different things in life. There is always something in life that gives us reasons to be afraid. There's always something that's going on. Always something every day. Reasons to be worried. Reasons to be anxious. Think about it. It started off when we was children. In our childhood years. Scared of the dark. Come on. <laughs> oh, you scared of the dark. Don't cut that light off. Look, you 60. Mom will keep the light on. I'll go to bed, boy. Scared of the dark. Scared of the boogeyman. The boogeyman. We were scared of some stuff, huh? Scared of that switch my mom went break off the, off the tree. When she was going, I'm going to show y'all she went to that tree, boy. You were scared, boy. Some of y'all went put two pair of shots. <laughs> oh, yeah, boy. Scared of that belt in the closet that nobody used. You never see them wearing that belt. They only use it for, to whip you. Yes, sir. When they, when they seen that belt in their hand, you knew something was, something was going on. Scared of that belt. Scared of the doctors. Scared to go to that doctor. Oh, it's time for your doctor's appointment. Boy, I used to, I don't, oh, I used to, come on, mom, I don't want to go to the doctor. Scared of the dentist's appointment. Oh, we going to the dentist. Scared of strangers. I don't know who that is. You know what I'm saying? Scared to swim. I don't want to go. Well, some kids scared to swim. 
But I think we, a lot of us be scared to swear. Scared of loud noises, firecrackers, and, 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 and gunshots, and, and all. We scared. But then we move on to our teenage years. I would say maybe from 13 to 19. Fears of being rejected. Fears of being laughed at at school. Fear of being different from everybody else. The fear of failure. The fear of going to college and what, what, what to expect. The fear of the unknown. I don't know. The fear of public speaking. Some of y'all say, I'm a grown adult and I'm, I still had that fear. <laughs> speaking in front of people. <laughs> the fear of speaking in front of when, you, when it's time to do a lesson, when it's time to do a practice. Just the fear of speaking in front of others, trying to prove your point, trying to prove your case. The fear of disappointing your parents. We all have these type of fears we grew up with and we all faced in our teenage years. But then it also continues even in our dark years. We have different type of fears. And I would even say the real fears. <laughs> Financial fears. Afraid how that bill will get paid. Afraid of losing my job, what I'm going to do. I live check from check. I don't know if this had to happen, what would I do? Will I ever get married fears, you know, to the right one? You know what I'm saying? Some of you, oh, I don't know if this is the right one. The Lord told you to marry John, but you accidentally married Jim. Yes. Oh, that's the wrong one. No, I'm just playing. I got the names mixed it up. You sure? <laughs> no, I'm just playing. But uh, what about these children worries? Hmm. Oh, I'm afraid my children in this time we're living in, in this time, I'm, I'm afraid with all this, 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 this stuff that they're pushing in the public school and all this, this stuff that, this peer pressure and, and all this stuff that's going on in the, in the, the girls going in the, girl, in the men's bathroom and, and all this homosexuality. Oh, I'm afraid of oh, my kids. I'm afraid of raising my kids. Like, oh, these kids. Man, I just got some bad news on my way coming to Bible study today. I got some bad news. My neighbor that we tight with, I, uh, I cut his hair. He come to the shop. We've been knowing him. They welcomed us. Uh, very friendly. Man, he came up to me right when I was coming over here. He said, hey, man, I want you to pray for me. I said, what's going on? He said, uh, Anthony, my son, they just killed him. Jesus. Yeah, right before I came here. Now, I used to cut Anthony hair. I just seen Anthony a few days ago. We just seen Anthony a few days ago uh, helping his mama in the flower bed. Uh, uh, he's, he was like 19 years old. Just love fixing it. He got shot. Dead like that. The fear of what's going on your kids. What about the fear of my parents' worries? Oh, my parents are getting older. Lord, I don't want to lose my parents. Just that, just those fears of what, what's going to happen. We all, we all, what about marital concerns? You saying things to yourself like, man, what does that ever work? Or it's like, what's going on? The fears of being divorced or the fears of, of, of man, these are things that just, no matter what happened, even if you're seasoned in life, they just don't go away. You go face these fears. And even for those who have been living a little longer, who's more seasoned, that's fears that you have to worry about too. Amen. The fear of health and sickness. Yes, Come on, when you get older, now you're more concerned about your health. Yes, you're more concerned about sickness. And you start thinking about generational stuff and, oh, I just pray, I hope this don't happen. Just those fears we fight. The fear of retirement. Oh, I'm scared to retire because I don't know if I retire, what's going to happen. I might. So they keep working. They keep, you know, the fear of being lonely. Your spouse might have passed away or, or someone might have passed away that you spun your whole life with. And now you're lonely. You lost a loved one that you was close to. Now you're lonely. And the last but not least, the fear of death. Just, Lord, just thinking, Lord, when is my time? Just, the Lord can call me home at any time. Which, and nowadays, young or old, but, but 
But when you're older, you have those thoughts more often. You start planning funerals. You start planning things that people are scared to plan. Like, you just have these thoughts, which I believe, it don't matter what, how old you is, I think that's something we should all plan. But anyway, some of y'all don't want to talk about that tonight. Losing a child. No matter what stage of life you're in, there are always something to cause you to worry about. Always something, always enemies, always haters, always gossiping, always lies, always financial concerns. And it don't matter how much money you got in the, in your, in the bank. It don't matter what title you have, if you're a, a doctor, a lawyer, or what position or ranks you have. These fears, you cannot escape these fears. You, you, we are not immune. Uh, 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 no one is immune to the real fears of life. We all have a reason to be afraid of something. It don't matter what. We all have different types of fears. It don't matter where you at in life. But in spite of all the fears we go through in life, God doesn't change. He, see, he still tells us, look, don't be afraid. What? You still don't want me to be afraid? And I have reasons to be afraid? It's like, let's be real. We'd be like, man, this is a good reason to be afraid. No. God don't accept, excuse, he don't accept stuff like, he say, don't be afraid. And he go, we're going to see why he tells us this. That's why I like what David says in Psalms 27. I like, I like this scripture so much, I got, I got a tattoo on my arm that talk about not being afraid. <laughs> but uh, anyway, it's not the same scripture, but it talk about not being afraid. Sometimes you got to remind yourself. <laughs> but anyway, so, so let's get into the, the, to the scripture. I just wanted to reel you in to see how important it is for us not, how God sees he doesn't want us to be afraid. He don't want us to be all scared. That's a song that I used to listen to by Bone Crusher. You understand know what I'm talking about? I ain't never scared. Remember that song? I ain't never scared, look, you know. That's, that's our, that should be our attitude. Even when we feel it, I ain't never scared. But anyway, so David encouraged us in verse 1. Let's go to verse 1. Even in spite of all of this stuff was going on, David says this. He says, the Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? Now look, David ain't no rookie in the game. We, we know all the things David faced. So we can't say, oh, David don't know what I've been through. What? Yo, let's, let me talk about a few things David went through. And for David to still say, the Lord is my light and my salvation, whom shall I fear? The Lord is the, then he tells us again, the Lord is the strength of my life. Whom shall I be afraid? He says it twice. Now, if anybody know about fear, it would be David. Amen. Remember, when David was faced against Goliath, a giant, not only that, but David was also chased and running from King Saul because he was insecure. Yes, yes. He was jealous. So David had to run from Saul. He defeated Goliath. He overcame Goliath. He overcame Saul. And then in his life, David finds himself running from his own son Amen. who was trying to kill him, Absalom. Not only that, David, whose daughter was raped by his own brother. Her own half-brother. David, who has messed up with Bathsheba and, and has to stand before God. Come on, fears. We talking about fears. David, who had, who, got in, who had to battle the Philistines and always had to watch his back everywhere he go because it was a continual battle with the Philistines. He always had to watch his back, watch his rearview mirror to see who's coming after him. Fear, David, who, who, who fought a lion. Who ripped the line? David, who fought a bear? Who would fight a lion? Who would fight a bear in here? I'm not talking about with no, no, no weapon, nut. Fight with your bare hand. David, if anybody knew about fear, anybody knew what, what, what a, being afraid was like would be David. But in spite of all of that, with everything that could cause him to be afraid, David says, the Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? And he said, he put a question mark on that. He never said, the Lord is my light and my salvation. I'm not going to be afraid. He said, whom shall I fear? Like, name him, name, name, name him. Name him. Name somebody. Name. 
Who? Him? Nope. Name somebody. Like he said it in a question, like I'm asking you for you to name something. Because whoever you name, nope. The Lord is my light. <laughs> name, nope. The Lord is my strength. It didn't matter who you named. That's what I like about a question mark. You got to see what's the question. <laughs> but anyway, so David says, whom shall I fear? So let's look at what David says he will and will not do. David says that's some things he will do and that's some things he will not do. Maybe we should. Let's, let's look at this. So in verse 1, bring me to verse 1. It says, I will not fear. Whom shall I fear? I'm not going to be afraid. Verse 1, I will not be afraid. Verse 3, I will be confident. See that? I will not be afraid. I will not fear. I will be confident. Verse 4, I will seek him. <laughs> Verse 6, I will offer sacrifices of joy. Verse 6, and I will sing praises. <laughs> the wills and the will nots. Now look, David had enemies all around him. He got trouble in his home. His kingdom is not like how it should be. His life is in jeopardy. But David says three quick points to, sum, to keep it. He says, I won't be afraid. I will be confident and I will rejoice. Ooh. In spite of his fears, in spite of the troubles and the problems and the things that he's going through in life and the hard times, his circumstances and everything that's that's coming against him. He says, I will not be afraid. I will be confident, not in him, in himself. I will be confident in the Lord <laughs> and I will rejoice. In so many words, I will worship. <laughs> so no matter what is going on in your life, he said he will not fear. He will be confident and he will worship. David made a decision that no matter what's going on in his life, the Lord is his light and his salvation and his strength. Here's why I believe David can say that in the midst of his situation. I have three quick points and I'm going to let y'all go. My first point, he don't have to be afraid because he know who God is. <laughs> take notes, take that down. He, he don't have to be afraid. The reason why David ain't afraid is because he know who God is. That's why he don't have a reason to be in fear. Because he know who God is. To me, per, he said, to me personally, not what I heard, but I, I know who God is. He never said, I know what the pastor say who he is. I, I know what my mama, who my mama say who he is. No, I know who he is to me. <laughs> it was personal. That's why I'm not afraid. Because your mama can tell you not tell you something, but you ain't had no experience. And you will be afraid because you don't know the experience. Mama know. Because she didn't been through that, so she's not afraid. But if mama tell you not to be afraid of this, don't, you might be afraid because you ain't never experienced. Right. David said, the Lord is my light. Yes. He knew something, something about it. Notice he didn't say, I'm afraid, I'm not afraid because I know what he's going to do. He didn't say that. He didn't say, I'm not afraid because I know when God is going to do it. He just said, I know who God is. David realized that as long as God is with me, everything will be all right. He is my light. Somebody say he is my light. And if you think about light, what is light? Light in the physical, it, it illuminates, right? Light, it, it, it guides, it, it, it guides us. It, it brings guidance. Light, what else light does? It reveals clarity to your path. It, it reveals uh, direction. David says, he is my light. Have you ever been in a dark place in your life and you couldn't see your way out, but then the Lord somehow shined his light in your situation. And then when you look, you was like, oh, I got it now. Because you can see it. Because you, you, you knew who the Lord was. You knew who he is. 
you know he's your light. And to give you all some scriptures, Psalms 119, 105, the Bible says that the, the word of God is a lamp into my feet and a light into my path. That means sometimes you won't see the whole, the whole destination, but as long as you know who the Lord is, every step you take is going to bring light. Every, every move you make, you know he's your light. He's going to reveal, light reveals what's in front of you. Light helps you see clear. Light helps you see uh, what's in front of you. It gives you direction. And David knew that the Lord was his light and his salvation and his strength. This shows that David trusted God. He trusted God. When we know who God is, y'all, we don't even have to be afraid. We don't have to be afraid. When we know who God is, now, nah, if you don't know who God is, Amen. you should be afraid. <laughs> yeah, if you're scared and you don't, you don't know who God is, then yeah, you, you should be afraid because that, you're in a bad situation. But if you know who God is, you shouldn't be afraid. And a lot of times, why, why we be afraid is because our relationship with him has been distant. Some of you might know, you, you know who he is, but you don't, you don't, you're not getting no clarity, you're not getting no direction because you're distant. You can't, you can't see. Your, your light is a little foggy. It's dim. You still got light, but, but, it, but you, you, it's like you can't see because your relationship has been dis, distant. You forgot who he say he is. And so we don't read the word. We, so we don't read the word to remind us who he say he is because we read the word to remind us. I'm sorry. We read the word to remind us of who he say he is. That's why we read because he never changes. God never changes. He's always the same. We change. Our perspectives change. He's the same yesterday, today and forever. So if we can't see it, something wrong with us. But God is still the same. He's always a light. He will always shine. He will always be a, a God. He will always reveal. He always give revelation. He always speaking. So if we can't see, it's something not right with the, with, with, with the fire, with the light inside of us. Amen? Amen. He, he, he will always be light. He will always be a deliverer. He's my salvation. He will always deliver in the times of trouble. He will always be my strength when I am weak. If you've ever been weak, he will always be. That's, that's his name. He's his strength. When we are weak, he, we, he, we are made strong. When our flesh is weak, when we can't do it, that's when he is made strong. He's our strength, strength like no other. And that's who he is. He always working things out for our good. Even if we might not understand, when we trust God, we just got to know that he's always working things out for our good. Even if we can't figure it out, it doesn't mean God ain't working it out. God is working something out. You just got to remind yourself, I know who he is. He is my light. I know who, I might be in a dark place right now, but he is my light. In a matter of time, he will show me. In a matter of time, he will lead me. In a matter of time, the light switch will come. I just got to continue to remind myself that he is my salvation, that he is my refuge, that he is my strength. I know this is a tough situation that I'm going through with my children, but I know, Lord, give me strength. He is my strength. He is. That's who he say he is. That's who he say he is. Mm. David knew who he was. That's why he wasn't afraid. Man, I remember when I was, um, my daddy used to come pick us up when we were small um, uh, to go stay sleep in Brobridge to, to his house. And my mom, my mom stayed out there and stuff like that. So he would come pick us up, man. And I remember sometimes he would take us riding on the roads out there, just going visit family, people we ain't never seen in a while. And so when he would take us, you know what I'm saying, we would go be, we would be visiting family all throughout the day. And so when it would be, about the time we would leave, it would be pitch black outside. It would be dark. And so we would leave, and so we, we're kids, and so my daddy, my daddy flying on them roads. Look, I don't know where he going. It's dark. 
I'm like, in my mind, I'm scared. I'm like, what, what, why is my daddy driving this fast? Like, where you going? What are you in a rush for? But in my mind, I'm like, why is he driving so fast? Like, bro, we, we in Bro Bridge. Like, come on, man. And so it's dark. Some roads he would, he would go on, and I don't remember. Some roads he would go on like you couldn't see nothing. I'm like, Lord, and, and, he, and the car just bouncing. I'm like, man, me and my little sister, man, we like, man, I don't know what's going on. Wherever we go, you need to hurry up and get that. <laughs> so, man, we small, we young. And so, man, <clears throat> in that moment, I didn't know. But now when I, the Lord just showed me that in that situation, the reason why my daddy could have drive like the way he was driving is because he knew where he was going. <laughs> he knew the way. He done drove around Bro Bridge, back streets, all his life. That's what he grew up. That's all he knew. So I should have, I didn't know. So I just need to trust that he, he knows the way. And I don't know the way. Just sit back and enjoy the ride. It might be scary, but I just got to trust that he is the light. <laughs> he, already, he know what he doing. I might not know the way. But if I follow the way maker, then he going to lead me to where I need to be. I just had to trust my daddy. <laughs> Ooh. So, yes. Look at the person next to you and tell him. God knows the road you're on. <laughs> He know that road you're on. Don't be afraid. He know where you at. Thank you, Lord. Amen. So David says, I won't be afraid because I know who God is. Verse 1. Don't be afraid because I know who God is. Now realize, we can't go too fast. David says, whom shall I be afraid? Who, whom shall I fear? Whom? When I hear the word whom, I think of a person. Yeah. Like, whom? Wait, wait, a person? So that means he was talking about somebody. Yes, My question is, who y'all scared of? <laughs> what, what person y'all scared of? Some of y'all came, oh man, my boss. No. But who y'all scared of? Because whoever that person is that's causing you to worry, compare it, compare them to what you know about God. And, and, and then see, because God is greater. Come on. God is mighty. God is sovereign. God is able. God is bigger than whoever it is you're afraid of. He's bigger. No need to be afraid because God is bigger than whoever it is. So I don't know who it is. God just told me to tell y'all that. Whoever you're afraid of, you ain't got to be afraid of who it, whoever that is. You don't have to because God is loving. God is omnipotent. Omnipresent. He's all knowing. He knows everything. The only reason you should be scared of a person if you don't know who God is. But if you know who God is, you know He's your light and your salvation and your strength. Why are you afraid? If you know the truth about God, I will not fear because I know who God is. But my second point, verse two and three, He says. I will be confident because I know what he's done. <laughs> Woo, let's read verse two and three. It says, I will be confident because I know, I know what he's done. It says, when the wicked came against me to eat up my flesh, my enemies and foes, they stumbled and fell. Verse three. It says, uh, uh, though an army may encamp against me, my heart shall not fear. Though war may rise against me, in this I will be confident. Woo! See, David knew who God is, and he knew what God has done already. David had history with God. David had previous experiences with God. David had encounters with God. David knew what God has done before in his life. See, he had some experiences. Verse 1 says, he talked about whom that person was. He says, whom? That's a person. But then in verse 3, when you see in verse 3, he talks about an army. He don't say whom again. He says an army. Another translation says a host should encamp against me. Amen. Now when I thought about it, he says 
uh, if war shall rise against me. I'm like, oh, this is bigger than a whom, nah. Wait, that's not a person. I started thinking, wait, that's powers. <laughs> he got through people only now to have to deal with powers. Not only people, but this world system. Yes, sir. Not only people, but stereotypes. Yes, sir. Not only people, but all them isms, racism and, 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 and materialism and paganism and, 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 and sexism and, and all these isms he had to face. That's some different types of powers policies and laws and different things that come against certain races and certain people. He had to face powers, armies, authorities. David says, even if I stand against powers and not just people, David still say, I will be confident. He said, I will be confident because his confidence was in God. I will be confident, even though I'm standing against something that never lost. I'm standing against something that never been defeated. I will be confident. Even if I can, even if I stand against powers and systems that won't want to see me fail. Even if I stand against things and systems that's designed to not see me prosper. Come on, y'all know to not see us successful to try to see us down and low and, and, and working uh, um, slavery jobs. And even though this system and, and programs and policies and laws is set for us not to win and to be and to succeed. David says, you know what? I don't care about all of that. I will be confident. He says, I will be confident. If God is for me, who can be against me? I don't care what they say. Who come against me? An army. I don't care if they all agree to come against me. I will be confident. David made up his mind that it didn't matter what he faced and how big it looked. I will be confident. It don't matter what it is, who it is, or what powers come against me. I will be confident. In so many words, if I had to translate that in our time right now, some of y'all say, I don't really say confident. But if I had to translate that now, see, in, in, in the Hebrew way, and if I had to translate that now in the 2024 translation nowadays, what, what, what I would say is it means you have to have some swag about it. <laughs> you got to have some swag, man. Come on, look at your neighbor and say, I want my swag back. <laughs> you got to have some swag. David has some swag to walk with a little strut on his side. Come on, to have a little attitude in his face. That's too many people walking around, too many believers walking around with their head down, scared of everything. Everybody. Oh, I don't know if I'm ever, uh, that's just too, they denied me. I can't get this business. They don't want, the doctor said I got uh, this, this disease. I don't know. They just walk with their head down. I don't never think I'm a, man, the, David says I will be confident. Who report shall you believe? The doctor, these systems, and what they say? Or are you going to believe the report of the law? David says, I'm confident in the law. When David went to face Goliath, he had all the things that man, might have seemed like it was uh, bigger than him. Saul offered to give him his army. He said, I don't want that. I'm going to use what, what works for me. And so when he went out to fight uh, King, uh, whatever his name is, Goliath, looked at him and said, oh, y'all bring this little knucklehead out here to fight? David says, you know what? <laughs> Say, I don't know what you're talking about. You come with all of that stuff, all of this wars and all that, but I come, my confidence, I come in the name of the law. Yeah. Don't matter how big the situation may look, look like you will never win. We have to remain confident. In the same scripture, you say, I will see the goodness of the Lord. In the same paragraph. But as believers who the world look up to us as examples, we walk around, uh, um, it, um, they, they're looking at us like, oh, I, I ain't going to church. You, you walking around with your head down too. Why should I follow Christ? When we walk around, oh, I don't know if it ever going to work. What? Come on, man. So David says, in spite of all the stuff he's going through, I'm going to be confident. 
David says, watch my swag. Watch, watch, watch my swag. Watch, watch, watch my confidence. Watch me walk with some confidence. Watch me walk like I know that God will work this out. Watch I know, watch I walk like I know God go have favor. Watch I walk like I know God go open that door. Watch I walk like I know the blessing go fall. Watch I, watch I walk like I know my child will get saved. Watch I walk like I know my mama will get saved. Watch I walk like I know I'm going to get that house. Watch I walk like I know I'm going to get that blessing. Watch I walk like I know I'm going to get that husband. Watch I walk like I know I'm going to get that wife. Watch I walk in confidence. Look at your neighbor and say, watch my swag. Come on, man. You got to get your swag back, man. Get your swag back. The reason why David was confident, because he remembered that God already, what God already done. It's almost like he had a flashback, Minister Sam. Like, whoa, wait. Hold on. Whoa, whoa, whoa. David says, when my enemies, in verse 2, when my enemies came to eat up my flesh, he says, they stumbled and fell. You see his flashback? He begins to testify, but wait, 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 wait. When they came up to eat, when whomever it was came up to eat up my flesh, yes, sir. he says, they stumbled and fell. And when you study the stumble and fell in the Hebrew, it's not just you just was running and you fell and then you, and you get right back up. No, when you study what stumble and fell means, that means that stumble means they got weak, fragile. That means their ankles, go read, sir, their ankles got fragile. Yes, and so they fell, and, and, and I believe uh, it's so fragile to where things begin to break. Yes, they stumbled. Sir. And then when fail means in Hebrew, it means that when they fell, they fell face down prostrate. That means that whenever his enemies came to eat up his flesh and foes, they couldn't get back up. <laughs> they were down. They, was, they were weak. They lost their power. They lost their strength. So David testifies. He already testified. That's why I believe he thinks about, I already know what God done. Just think about what God's done. He had a flashback. He already defeated my enemies. He already defeated my enemies. And so, and so David remember what the Lord already done. And he made a confident prediction that everything is going to be all right. Amen. He took a look back at what he already seen God do and makes a confident prediction that everything will work out. No matter what you're dealing with now, y'all, just look back what he's done so far that should give you some confidence in the Lord. Just look back over your life. For real. Like, just look, look back at what he's done already. That should give you confidence in your next move. Yes, sir. Amen? Amen? All right, let me give you a logical example. Some of y'all probably like, okay, I'm not understanding this. All right. Let me give you a logical example. So <clears throat> it's called finding a pattern. If I say to you, I got four numbers in my head, I'm going to give you three of them, and I want you to predict the fourth one. Watch what happens. Y'all ready? Eight. Two, four, six. Eight. Now, the number that was next probably would have been 2024. Now, I just told y'all to guess what could be the next number. But that, that could not have been the number I was thinking about. But you already predicted that the next number would have been eight. And because you saw the pattern of what uh, I already presented to you, you made a logical conclusion that the next step has to follow the pattern of what has already been pr presented. And I want you to see that the pattern of the Lord, has a, he, he has already done. Look at all the other stuff he done. He done made a way. He done provided. So now you should make a logical prediction, a confident prediction that the next one got to be this. Come on. Come on. It, it, it have to be that. Because two, four, six, eight. who do we appreciate? God. <laughs> so you got to think about it that way. He not, just look back at over your life. And I want you to see the pattern of what the Lord has already done. Ways he already made, prayers he already answered, doors he already opened, healing after healing, blessing after blessing. Come on, man. And if he did it before, I just got to have confidence that he's going to do it again. Come on, tell somebody, follow that pattern. Oh, you better follow that pattern. Don't, don't get off track. 
Last point. Ooh, I'm on good timing, boy. Last point. So number one, David says, in spite of all my troubles in my situations and in my circumstances, he says, I won't fear because I know who God is. Verse two, I mean, number two, he says, in spite of all the things that I'm going through right now, that I'm facing, the challenges, the fears that I got to face, he says, I'm confident because I know who God, what God done. But my last point, last point, not only that he knew who God is, not only he knew what God done, but he says, I will rejoice because I know what worship does. Ooh. Come on, deacon. <laughs> you know where I'm going. Come on. He says, I know what worship does. Oh, I'm not making this up. I'm going to show y'all where to say that in the Bible. Because some of y'all, y'all, look, don't take my word. David's standing against people. He's standing against powers. So many reasons to be worried. Reasons to be afraid. Reasons to be anxious. And David says in the midst of all of that stuff, in verse 4, bring me to verse 4, in, in, in the midst of all of that stuff that he's going through, he says, one thing, <laughs> he says, one thing I desire of the Lord. That's only one thing on my mind. He says, Lord, I just need one thing. I got enemies all, on, all around me, but I need one thing. I got a reason to stay up at night yet, but, but, but I need one thing. Look at what he asked for. He ain't asked for, he, he never said that one thing, Lord, all this trouble and fear that I'm going through and the stress I'm going, he never said, Lord, I need, I need some alcohol. Ah, he never said, that's the one thing. If I just had a drink, I, it's go, my problem will go away. Nah, he didn't say that. He never said, oh, I just need a little joint and, and all my fear and problems will go away. One thing, Lord. He didn't say that. He says, one thing that I desire. He said, I don't need to make them like me. I don't need my enemies to like me. I, I, Lord, I just hope that they like me. No, 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 no. I don't need you to send another check in the mail to solve this. But I, I'll take another check, though. But Y'all know what I'm trying to say. I don't need... It's not about the money, Lord. I need some money so I can get through this problem. No, no, money don't answer all things. Well, the Bible does say money answers all things. But y'all know what I'm talking about. Money don't answer healing. You can't pay for your, uh, a healing. You can pay for a doctor, a good doctor, but the healing comes from God. Y'all know what I'm trying to say. So, somebody had to Craig. I had to make sure I, I said that right. So, David says, but I need your presence. I don't even need you to remove my enemies. He never said, Lord, I just pray you get rid of all my enemies so I can be at peace. Nah, God doesn't always remove your enemies. God keeps your enemies right there in front of you. Because remember, there's a scripture that says he prepares a table. Way over there? Oh, no, in front of him. So he don't remove your enemies. God doesn't always remove your enemies. He want them to see. <laughs> So he don't ask them to, he don't ask to remove. He says, Lord, I just need one thing that I may seek you. I need your presence. I just want to worship you, Lord. I just want to abide and to dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life. That's the one thing that I want. This right here shows the importance of worship. In spite of your troubles, if you want to get through some things, you got to worship him. You got to worship him. <clears throat> but a lot of times, we look at worship like it's optional or something. We, we treat worship like an advertiser, like, oh, I don't, I don't need no advertiser. I'm just here for the word. And then you leave out of here the same way you came in because you ain't getting worship. I notice it. Sometimes we wait till the third song to come. No, I'm serious. We wait till the third song, then we come for a word, then you leave church. Back. Wait, what the word was about? Because your heart wasn't fertile. You did, your heart was, you came in with all the problems and troubles. And, and, but worship, it sets the atmosphere. Just like how it's important for seed. Seed is truth. Our hearts is like soil. And a seed, no matter how good a seed is, if it's not in the right environment, 
it won't be effective because worship sets the environment. The reason why you stressed out and you worried, but I, I got a word, but you didn't position yourself to worship. You ain't surrendered. You ain't lift your hands up. You ain't get into a position where you wanted to see God. Worship is important if we have an understanding of worship and not treat it like a spectator sport. We stand there and watch worship, and if it, if it looks so good watching, imagine how much more would it be participating. It's like standing there watching a glass of water. You're thirsty, but you're watching the water drip over. Ooh, that water look good. That water look good, but I wish, mm, mm, I want some water. Man, pick up the water and drink it. If you think it look good watching, imagine you're going, refreshing, living water. So it bothers me when I see people watch worship. I understand <clears throat> if you don't know the Lord, yeah. If you don't know what God done for you, and if he ain't never did nothing for you, then I understand you keep your hands closed and you watch. Maybe you go one day in the process, you go catch on and you go remember. But for those who know what God has done, that should be no reason your, your hands should be down and you're looking at the ceiling and you're worried about what other people think. You're going to mess around and miss your deliverance worried about what people think. You're going to mess around and miss what God has for you trying to figure out what's going on around you. Leave that to the security. Leave that to other ministries. But you're missing out your blessing because you focus on the distractions and the other cares of life. David says, that's the one thing I desire. All that other stuff, money, all that other stuff, I want to I be blessed, I want to prosper, I want this, I want healing, but I desire his presence. I desire his presence is because in his presence there is joy. In his presence there is freedom. He inhabit the praises of his people. That's where he dwells. He dwells in our praise. The reason why you can't feel him because you ain't invite him. You just, you just trying to conjure up and hope that he come through. No, but you got to invite him. Whoa, musicians, you better come up. If you feel the energy, come up. Look. So, so, so David got into his presence. Oh, but we treat worship like it's just uh, 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 uh. like 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 you go to Z's and order a main meal. Uh, uh, but nah, I don't want no sides. I, I, I'm just I just came here for the meat. But nah, but it comes with two sides. You know, it, it's really go it's really go um, stir up and, and tastes really great with it. Nah, I'm just here for the word. I'm here for the meat. Man, you better get your worship on. You better get, you better, I take corn grits. I, I, let, let me get two. Ooh. Oh, yeah, man, don't leave out nothing. That come with the package. Yeah, but we come to church after the singing to so come get a word and leave out any of the same. The word was good. You got a whole bunch of knowledge, but your spirit ain't never been stirred up. You leave out of here knowing a lot of stuff, but worship engages body, soul, mind. Worship body. It, it invites you to clap. You move your body. God commands us to move our body. Amen. It invites your soul. That's when your emotions get stirred up. That's when you begin to move. You begin to dance. And you begin to sing. It invites your soul. And it also invites your spirit. Just like when Saul called David to play the harp, it cast out spirit. See, worship engages all three triumph. Man, let me tell y'all something. You missing out on something that, that God been wanting to give you. So stop putting worship on the side and get into his presence. And it shouldn't matter who's singing, it shouldn't matter what song is playing. It should, I don't care who's singing up here. Your job, our job is to get into that place and to seek him and watch how God moves. Watch how God moves. Watch how God move. Because I believe worship before the word is so important. It prepares our hearts. It helps us focus. But we so fast to get out the presence. We so fast to move around. We, we want to go to the restroom. We, wanna, we, we just can't 
The reason why a lot of times we don't stay in the presence of God or we can't get into is because we might be dealing with something we scared to face. People run out of the presence of God is because they're facing some stuff that, that they, they know God will reveal to them. And, and now, I'm tell, when you get into the presence of God, God begins to show you yourself. He show you your pride. He show you uh, your heart. He show you the things you've been dealing with. So now you don't want to get into his presence because you're scared that God is going to break you off. Woo! Come on, I know how it feels to get into the presence of God. So, 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 look at it this way. Look at it this way. Look at it this way. Without the right environment, even a healthy seed can't grow effectively. David says, Lord, I desire you the most. Let me live with you. Let me look at you and let me listen to you. Do you desire his presence tonight? When was the last time you set time out, you and God, just to seek his presence? I'm not talking about set time out to, to serve. Now the Lord convict me. I, I, I took a good break, son. I'm talking about just to seek his presence. Because sometimes we, 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 we come here with a Martha spirit. We want to serve the Lord and work and work. And that's a form of worship. And that's great. But when do we want to sit at his feet and just listen to what he got to say? We, we, just want what, we just want to hear him and see him and, and live like him. We just want him to speak to us. We just want him to give us peace and, and hear what he got to say. That's why we live in a life of fear and anxiety. It's because when we really examine our hearts, we ain't never been in a place of worship in a while. I'm not talking about putting on your car, just letting the worship music play. No, that's feeding yourself with work. I'm talking about participating. And just like you position yourself in a prayer closet to pray, the same thing with worship. Let me get into a place where I just lift him up. I'm not asking him for anything. I don't need anything. So how can you come in daddy's house and not acknowledge him? I don't want nothing. You've been good. You know the desires of my heart. And one thing I desire is your presence, God. Because when I got your presence, I can deal with all the troubles in my life. When I got your presence, I can deal with this heartache. I can deal because you give me the strength. You give me everything that I need to endure. Why have I been so burnt out lately? Why have I been so stressed out lately? Lord, I've never been in your presence. Could that be the reason why? You, 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 you're so uh, uh, anxious and you're so, I need to get in the presence of God and seek him. Oh, God. Verse 5 says this. Let me go close. Verse 5 says this. Go, bring me to verse 5. He says, if I can just get into your presence and I can worship you. Look what verse 5 says. But you got to look at it like this. We see what verse 5 says, but verse 5 follows verse 4. <laughs> So we see what it says, but verse five follows verse four. Let's see what's in verse four. He says, Lord, I need to get in your presence. One thing I desire is to get in your presence, to behold your beauty. He says to dwell in your house, to inquire in your temple. And then it, look what he find out what happens in the presence of God. Verse five, after he gets into the presence of God, then he says, in the time of my trouble, he shall hide me. Look what he find out in the presence of God. I decide to seek him. I decide to worship him. I decide to surrender. Then I find myself, ooh, in the trouble that was going on in my life, the Lord hides me. He hides me where? In his pavilion. Now, if you know anything about a pavilion, a pavilion is a space where it's like a covering. <laughs> it covers you from the sun. And, but, but the thing about a pavilion is it protects, but they can still see you. The same thing with the word hide. If you look at the word hide, the verb hide, it doesn't mean to go lock yourself in a dark room, in a closet, and cut the lights off and shh, be quiet. It don't mean that. The, word, the verb hide means to get into a place <clears throat> where, it, it means to get into a place, let me see what it says. 
The word high says, it, it doesn't mean to lock yourself in a closet, but the word high means to put you in place where the people who want to slay you can see you but can't touch you. The people that's coming again, they can see you but they can't touch you. Why? Because you're covered. To be put in a place where no weapon formed against you shall prosper. It's a place of protection. But can I show y'all that verse 6 follows verse 5? Presence. The Lord begins to hide you. Now you're protected. You're shielded. You don't have to worry about any harm. You don't have to worry about nothing coming against. Look, but look what said. Look, look what comes after verse 5. You're hidden. He says, since the Lord hides me from trouble and keep me from fear. Now verse 6 says this. So now I will offer sacrifices of joy. Amen. He says, I will sing. Yes, I will sing praises to the Lord. He says, I will sing. Can I tell y'all, it's okay to sing. It's okay to dance. It's okay to run. It's okay. I will rejoice. I will sing praises. When I get to the tabernacle, I want to act like God done something. It's okay to rejoice. When we come into the house of God, and now I'm saying the house of God, but in those days, the temple wasn't even built yet until David's son came, Solomon. But that, that, what God is saying in this plant sense, we are living tabernacles. In those days, they had living, they had moving tents. So that means you don't have to just be in the house of God. You carry the presence with you wherever you go. You can be in Walmart. You can be in Target. Lord, I want your presence. You build a tabernacle. You carry the presence wherever you go. Don't just worship him on Sundays. Don't just worship him on Tuesdays. But we worship him Monday through Sunday. You know how I can tell if a person worship God? You know how you can tell that a person have a personal worship relationship with God? It's because they're so excited to come Sunday and express it. If you ain't worshiping Monday through Saturday, I'm not surprised you ain't worshiping on Sunday. Because you got a, you got a, uh, if it's seven days, you got a one out of seven. <laughs> you, you fail. <laughs> but if you making, if you got a six out of, if it's Saturday, you, you worship six days a week, then I know for sure that Sunday gonna be. I just can't wait. Because look, David says, one thing I desire. David seek God every day. A lot of people miss out by holding back, especially men. Men are afraid to lift their hands. They're afraid to express. That's not the way I was raised. My daddy raised me to be more serious and to be, you know, man, that ain't got nothing to do with the way you was raised. This is a commandment. If you want your family to be blessed, if you care about them, when you worship and you begin to overflow, it leaks on your family. But I'm military. It don't matter. We serving a God. He's the Lord of hosts. He called us to be like him. And, 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 and last but not least, you're holding back worship that's not yours. It ain't for you anyway. It's for him. He wanted the way he wanted. He liked it the way he liked it. And he wants you to do it joyfully. He wants you to do it with your hands lifted up. He wants you to do it singing songs. He wants you. That's what he wants. So when you don't do it, you're not hurting him. You losing out on what he want to do to you. Come on, man. You got to worship, man. Don't be worried about what they think and what they say. Real men worship. Real men cry. Real men get into the presence of God. Yes. Yes, we got to get into the presence of God. Because in the presence of God is safety. In the presence of God is peace. In the presence of God is joy. In the presence of God is healing. In the presence of God is love. In the presence of God is strength. In the presence of God is freedom. In the presence of God is guidance. In the presence of God is revelation. In the presence of God is comfort. In the presence of God is resurrection, re restoration. In the presence of God is provision. In the presence of God is forgiveness. If you would just get into the presence of God, most of the stuff you're going through, you wouldn't be going through tonight. We are so logical. We are always trying to figure things out. And when we can't figure it out, we just get into a place where we don't do nothing. But God wants us to worship him in spirit and truth. It doesn't matter how we feel. If you don't feel like it, just do it until you feel it. 
Do it until you feel it and watch how God move. Don't let your personality, don't let your flesh, don't let whatever it is stop you from seeking God because that's the one thing that he desired. That's the one thing that David desired. But can I tell y'all, that's what we desire, but can I tell y'all what's God's greatest desire? Don't you know that God desires things as well? David desires his presence, but you know what God desires? It ain't no tricky question. He desires you. He desires you. He desires a relationship with you. Every day you wake up, he wakes you up. He, he just longs for that relationship. That's his desire. And worship is one of the main pathway we express it to him. He wants a relationship with you. Because we always know God to, if you touch God in worship, he going to touch you right back. He going to touch you in worship. And before God usually does something, he waits for you to touch him first. It's almost like if me and Brother Carl playing tag. Y'all remember that game tag? This is how God do. If, you tag, if I tag Brother Carl, he tag me right back. That's how God do. He go, he got, he go give you something right back. The woman with the issue of blood, when she got her healing, she touched him. And then she got something back. See, when you touch God, he gonna touch you back. That's how he roll. When you tell God, I love you, he gonna tell you, I love you too. Come on. When you tell God, Lord, there's no one else I'd rather be without, he gonna tell you there's no one else I'd rather be without you. You tell God, I would die for you to live, he gonna tell you I already did. So that you can live. If you desire God tonight to be with him tonight, we go pray. David said one thing I desire. He says, fear? Mm -mm. David says, I'm covered. David desired God. He trusted God. He says, Lord, I know who you is. I know who you are. I know what you have done. Even when I have never always done what was right. You still kept blessing me over and over and over again. God, I just want to worship you, God. I trust in you tonight. Lord, you see all the struggles and the pain and the things that I'm going through even now. But God, I would trust in you, God. Trust you through it all because you know the path. You know what's in front of me. You know what you're trying to get out of me. You know what you're working out. You see the whole picture. Help me to trust in you and to worship you through it. God, we just want to be more like you. Carry us, bring us through, hide us in your presence. In the meantime, Lord God, we go worship you. We're going to praise you. We're going to lift you up, God, no matter what it looks like. We're not denying our circumstances. We're not denying our situation, God, but we're recognizing that you're greater. We recognize and we acknowledge your presence. You're always with us. You will never leave us nor forsake us. If you did it before in our life, if you brought us through bigger challenges, God, then what we're going to go through, the things where we're facing ain't nothing, Lord God. We trust in you. You are our light. You are our salvation. You are our strength. So God, be there, be our light. For you say that you are the light of the world and you overcame the world. We put our trust in the light. You say that you are our salvation, just like David called upon you. And you came to die for our sins so that we can have salvation. You say, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever called upon him shall be saved, not perish, but have everlasting life. And God, you say that you would give us strength. Strength to fight. Strength to, to walk this walk. Strength to be closer. Strength to go through this life, God. We can't make it without you. So God, at this moment, God, we just want to say a little prayer to you, Lord God, praying that you would truly hear our hearts tonight. So at the sound of my voice, I want everyone to repeat after me. Say, Most High God, here I am tonight. Just the way I am. In need of your presence. In need of your grace. In need of your forgiveness. 
God, you see the fears that I face. You see the problems. You see the circumstance. But God, I will trust in you tonight. God, hide me in your presence. Give me confidence. Believing that you are working things out. God, I believe that you love me so much that you gave me your son. And he died on the cross for my sins. And you say that if I call upon him, I'll be saved. God, save me tonight. Jesus, I call upon you. Come into my heart. Come into my life. Be my light. Be my guide. For the rest of the days of my life. In Jesus' name. Amen. Come on, give God some glory. Thank you all for your time. I pray that this word was tailor-made for you tonight. So uh, I'm going to just pray the benediction and let y'all go home, eat y'all some good meals, meditate on this word. And um, just if I had to tell, if y'all don't remember anything that I said tonight, y'all don't remember nothing. 365 days of your life, y'all don't ever see me. Just remember these three words. May the Lord bless you. May he keep you. May he shine his face upon you. May he reward you. May he grace you. May he protect you. Pray that everything you touch will be a blessing. You will be a blessing to others. You will be light and salt in this world. You reflect his glory. God, we just pray that you give traveling grace. Be with every person that's in here tonight. Keep them. Continue to open doors. Continue to have favor upon them. Bless our pastor and his family. Protect him. Keep him as well. And we thank you for all what you're doing. And we say these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Y'all be blessed. Love y'all. Thank y'all.